afternoon and welcome to the Tuesday, July 12th, 2022 Public Works Committee meeting. <clears throat> now it's time for roll call and determination of quorum. Lehman? Here. Evans? Here. Roberts? Here. Ham? Stroman? Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. And now it's time for adoption of the agenda. Move to adopt. Motion to adopt by Councilman Stroman, the second by Councilman uh, Lehman. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Now it's time for general public comment. This is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the committee on any issue not limited to items on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the council members present. I don't see anybody. I don't have anything in front of me, so I will open and close general public comment. We'll move on to consent items, items one through eight, and I will turn it over to the public works director for any comments on these. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll speak to items two through five, and then um, on non-consent, uh, we've got a number of people in the audience today that'll be addressing those items. So um, I'll get going with item number two. Item number two is a professional services agreement with HDR Incorporated uh, on water and wastewater improvements that have been in front of you for a number of, uh, of times. I believe the, this represents over $8 million in um, uh, project costs, um, so uh, uh, hired HDR to do the bidding services as well as construction administration on those uh, significant projects. Item number three and four are um, grant applications for bridge uh, work. Uh, the first grant application is on the Chapel Lane Bridge, which uh, we had consultants here from Bros Engineering a few weeks ago and discussed uh, that um, with the new um, federal funding available, we're taking the opportunity to pro uh, apply for a federal grant, uh, which is a zero percent match uh, for Chapel Lane. I believe we previously had uh, received a big grant, which is a state sponsored grant for that same structure. So we're, we're applying for all the grants we can on uh, uh, for the same uh, structures to see uh, uh, what we can leverage as far as uh, federal and or state funding to uh, work on our structures. Uh, item number four is a big grant, which is the state program grant uh, for Tomahawk Drive. Uh, once again, that uh, particular structure was mentioned at council the other night uh, with representatives of uh, Bros Engineering. Uh, the Tomahawk Drive structure does not meet the um, threshold, the cost threshold to apply for the big federal grant or BIP grant, if you will. Um, so this is a standard grant for that project. And then uh, item number five is a change order to uh, Lindex Co. Uh, currently we're doing uh, work on East Anamosa Street and as part of the construction, uh, we determined uh, that it was in the city's best interest to um, make connections between two pressure zones. Uh, that's the purpose of this change order, to provide redundancy in our system and to provide additional water uh, in that uh, eastern part of town. So uh, about a $34,000 change order. Uh, it's money well spent, uh, will help us in the future wheel water in that part of town. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bigler, who uh, will address his items. Thank you. Uh, Parks and Recreation has three items on today's agenda. The first one, item number six, is to approve the purchase of playground equipment uh, for uh, Sioux Park. This is a, to replace the existing equipment out there which is 30 years old, uh, which is wearing out, cannot get replacement parts, it's out of compliance. Uh, so uh, this is a, it seems like a lot of money for play equipment and it is, but that is uh, some expensive stuff. So you can see that uh, in our parks we've got considerable amount of assets uh, that we need to make sure that everything is uh, in working order and, uh, and providing a, a safe experience for the community. Item number seven is a professional services agreement with uh, FMG for the design and uh, bidding uh, services for the Sioux Park tennis court reconstruction. That is a, a vision fund project. 
which uh, will uh, bids will be opened up uh, the first part of November this year uh, with a completion of construction uh, the end of October 2023. And then the final item, item number eight, is a, a small change order for uh, uh, the deck project at uh, Meadowbrook Golf Course. Uh, when they got to a point, uh, they discovered some wood that needed to be replaced, which was not part of the original uh, uh, contract uh, estimate, so that is the change order there. Do we have anybody from the dais that has any questions on any of these? Go ahead, Mr. Stroman. Thank you, Chair. Um, may I direct your question to Mr. Beagler? You may. So, Jeff, what's the status of that um, uh, Meadowbrook project on the deck? Are they have they torn out or? It's finished. Yes, finished? they're so finished with it. Yes. And what they did was they what, what all did they do? Well, they stripped it down to the the supports underneath and then replaced all of the decking. And when they got to the stairs. Uh, that's when they discovered that the supports needed to be replaced as well, and so that was the additional amount that needed to be done. But that decking has now been re replaced. And so what type of materials did they use for the decking? They used a, a Trex composite material instead of the wood, so that should hold up quite a bit longer than the wood. And lower maintenance? And Correct. Stuff? Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, had... Um, one for Mr. Tech. Absolutely. Also, um, Dale, on the um, item number two with the uh, administrative services for these water projects and wastewater projects, um, and you said there's like $8 million worth of projects going on out there? Sites or? Yeah, I believe uh, I, I want to say it's it, it's right at eight million dollars uh, combined. Uh, those numbers aren't finalized, obviously, until we get through some of the bidding. But based on the preliminary work that they've done, that's the uh, estimated cost for that. Okay. Can you give a uh, bit of a overview of what? Does miscellaneous projects and I sure I, I I can give you a, a brief rundown if you'd like. Uh, let's see, there are nine project components. Two are for water, and seven are for our water re reclamation um, facilities. Uh, we, uh, the two water projects are the Robbinsdale booster station, electrical system upgrades, and then the uh, Skyline Reservoir security fencing, uh, the Signal Hill valve vault security fencing, and North Rapid Reservoir fencing. Uh, for water reclamation, the seven projects are digester waste gas flare and gas conditioner system improvements, uh, the standby generator removal and replacement, uh, the rotating biological contactor blower building uh, MCC and starter replacement, uh, the pretreatment screening bypass channel grit classifier improvements, uh, septic cover and hatch replacement, and trickling filter pump number two and number four replacement. Also, uh, the grease line piping replacement out at Water Rec, uh, and then the sludge holding pond aerator mixer replacements, and then uh, main entry gate and fence realignment project and fence removal. And also UV, which is our ultraviolet disinfection uh, building uh, HVAC improvements. So that's all of the components of uh, what's included uh, for this professional services agreement. So for these upgrades or these changes that are being made, do your, does your staff like constantly monitor this or did someone come in and say, hey, these things need replaced or how does that? No, that in fact, a lot of these improvements are born from our operations folks, the people that operate the plant. Uh, they know better than anybody the condition of the equipment. Uh, out there. So some of these improvements are um, upgrades to existing facilities out there, but there are also uh, a number of these improvements that are getting ready for the plant expansion, which we've talked to you about uh, many, many times. Um, so anyway, in fact, uh, tomorrow there will be an item on legal and finance to talk about the funding for the plant expansion. Uh, none of these projects, I believe, are throwaway projects, so everything that's being done uh, is of benefit today and will be uh, maintained into the future even with the plant expansion. Great. I appreciate that they're 
keeping track of our facility and, and what needs to be done to keep it in top working condition. <coughs> Thank you. That's all I have. I yield. Thank you. So I move to approve these. <laughs> second. Have a motion to approve by Councilman Evans, a second by Councilman Lehman. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. <clears throat> now we're on to non consent items, items 9 through 11. I will open public comment. I don't have anything in front of me, so I guess I will close public comment. We'll move on to items 9 presentation and acknowledgement of wastewater utility system master plan dated May 2022 is prepared by Black and Beachick? Beach. Beach? Okay. Black and Beach, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Minna, uh, Chairman Roberts. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm not doing the presentation, which is really good for me uh, and better for you guys. Uh, I have the honor of introducing uh, one of our incredible people that work behind the scenes every day to keep this city functioning. Uh, Nicole Lisi is a registered professional engineer with the state of South Dakota. She is a graduate from uh, South Dakota State in 2006, and she got her master's in 2008. She's been with the city since 2011. She is our, I will call it, uh, sanitary sewer expert. Uh, when it comes to design and all things related to that. She has been managing this project since 2018 in conjunction with Michelle Lashley, who is our design group coordinator. And uh, I just want to say I, I've watched the, the long version of this thing, and it's fantastic. You guys are going to get the abridged version, and it's fantastic too. So I'll turn it over to Nicole. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Roger. I'm happy to be here today to tell you about this extremely important project for the city's wastewater collection system to assist with planning for the future. The city hired Black & Veatch to perform the wastewater utility system master plan project, and their sub-consultants on the project included FMG Engineering and Banner & Associates. Big picture, a utility system master plan addresses the immediate and long-term needs with a focus on growth and the improvements needed for a utility moving forward. This presentation will be a pretty high-level presentation and not focus so much on the technical details but instead focus on what the city gains from this project. A copy of the executive summary of the project report was attached to the agenda summary for your information and reference and this presentation follows the information contained in the executive summary. The Utility System Master Plan project uh, is a comprehensive plan update with four major tasks. Number one, update the city's existing master plan, which was last done in 2008. Number two, identify improvements required to support growth of the wastewater utility over a 100-year planning period. This allows the city to plan for future growth and to promote development. Number three, the third task is to assess existing collection system pipeline and facility assets for conditions. I will note that this project did not include an assessment of the water reclamation facility. And the fourth task is to provide a capital improvement plan or CIP recommendations for system expansion, existing system improvements, and replacement of aging assets. This presentation will review these four tasks in more detail. First, let's start off with some facts uh, regarding the city's existing wastewater collection system to give you some perspective on the project and the size of the system. So Rapid City's wastewater collection system has approximately 350 miles of pipeline, ranging in size from 8 inch to 48 inch diameter, 7,500 manholes, seven lift stations, 6.5 miles of force main, and the population served in 2015, which was the baseline planning year for this project, was 75,900 people. And the city serves as a regional service provider to four sanitary districts. So I will note that this wastewater master plan project includes all of these components in the analysis and recommendations. 
The first task of the project included updating the city's existing master plan from 2008. This included updating the city's GIS database, which provides mapping of the wastewater collection system, as well as an update to the hydraulic model to reflect the city's current system. Uh, a hydraulic model allows examination of pipe capacity and to examine how a system will respond after an intense rainstorm. These are both very important tools for the city to have. Once these were updated uh, to current, the project moved on to task two, which includes a system evaluation to identify improvements required to support growth. Service boundaries were established for planning years based on where the city expects to provide uh, wastewater service to into the future. Uh, the map on the screen shows the service boundaries established for the project's planning years, including the gray boundary, year 2025, near term, the blue boundary, 2045, the midterm, the green line, 2115, long-term boundary, and for reference, the brown line on the outermost limits represents the metropolitan planning boundary that the city has established. So this plan allows the city to plan for the long term or 100 year period of anticipated flow and necessary improvements needed to the system. Task two also consider considered population and employment projections which were coordinated with the city's community development department through the year 2115. They're based on anticipated growth patterns and locations where growth is planned to occur. A table of the population projections for our planning years and the resulting wastewater production flows are in the table on the screen. And ultimately, population was converted to the expected wastewater flows to be an input into our hydraulic model for analysis. The projected wastewater flows were input into the model for the future planning years and modeled system deficiencies resulted in recommended projects uh, for where improvements are needed uh, into the system. The recommended hydraulic improvements include capacity relief projects, projects to increase capacity in the system, as well as extension projects to extend service outside of the current service area. The map on the screen is representative of the recommended uh, capacity projects that were a direct result of the modeling effort done and identify the improvements needed in the planning years to support growth. The 100 year planning that was done with this project allows for pipes to be sized for the long term flows. Uh, once task two was, to, was completed to plan for system growth, we moved on to task three, which included an assessment of existing collection system pipeline and facility assets for condition. This was done through a capital planning using risk-based approach. This is an industry standard approach for prioritizing pipeline replacements. And the objective of the prioritization is to maintain a desired level of service for customers, communities, and the environment at an acceptable level of risk. This kind of approach can help provide answers to questions such as what's the current state of the system or what assets are critical to sustain operations. Through this project, likelihood of failure or LOF scoring criteria as well as consequence of failure, COF, criteria were developed to determine the ultimate risk for each gravity main in the system. To complete this assessment, a review of the city's GIS inventory was completed and factors considered. The factors considered in the scoring include, for the likelihood of failure, things like condition of the pipe, age, material, depth, if it was a flat sewer main or if it had uh, sanitary sewer overflows that had occurred on the pipe segment. Alternatively, the consequence of failure criteria established uh, were things such as are there critical customers in the proximity, the diameter, 
This, if a, it impacts a major street or railroad crossing, economic impacts, environmental impacts, and model depth of flow. So ultimately, the likelihood of failure times the consequence of failure equates to an ultimate scoring of risk. The figure on the bottom right is a, a graphic to show uh, in the lower, lower left. Blue is the lowest risk priority, and they increase in level um, up to the highest level of risk, or the red. The highest priority pipes are identified to the city to, uh, to evaluate for replacement. The graphic on this screen represents the city's risk results for all 350 miles of pipeline that we have. Overall, the city's wastewater collection system has approximately 75% of the system identified in the very low to low risk category, the blue and green categories, and approximately 7% of the system identified in high or very high risk, the red or pink areas. This assessment gives the city areas of the system to focus on um, for where the high risks were identified, including focusing televising efforts for inspection of pipes to confirm condition and needs for pipeline replacement. With the completion of task three, we moved on to task four. Task four includes the results from the future system evaluation done in task two, along with the assessment of the existing pipelines and facilities in task three, and resulted in a recommended capital improvement, or CIP, recommendations for system expansion, existing system improvements, and replacement of aging assets. The CIP recommendations included all projects considered uh, and they're listed on the screen. And they were added to the CIP as improvement triggers were hit or the need for the project came to light. Priorities were also assigned for each project. Part of task four, the CIP recommendations included an evaluation of budget strategies. The graph on the, sh on the screen shows the estimated city costs for improvements over time. The city's current annual budget for wastewater collection system infrastructure is approximately $6 million, represented by the blue line on the screen. Two different budget strategies were considered in formulating the CIP recommendations, and they include, one, the green line, an as-needed budget or default budget, which represents the results of this project analysis driven by the year identified when the improvement was needed. Or two, the red dashed line represents a restricted budget uh, that was considered using the current budget and balancing projects out, um, balancing project needs and city spending out over the next 20 years. The focus of the CIP recommendations in this project was for the short term, just the next 20 years, but ultimately allows the city to plan for funding into the midterm. Also included with task four, project sheets were developed with information specific to each recommended project um, to be used as a starting point for when future projects are considered and will be a very useful tool for when a project development or when a future project comes into development. The project sheets contain information, uh, initial design information such as trigger flow rates, project location, length of pipe, your required and estimated costs. The final CIP recommendations formulated for the project results in budget recommendations, and they ultimately, the ultimate recommendations include, number one, maximize the current $6 million budget adjusted yearly for inflation with prioritization of improvements. Uh, this results in a balanced budget over the next 20 years. Based on the analysis, the budget can be balanced by spreading out projects more over the next 20 years. Number two, the city is to prioritize projects between expansion needs, capacity needs, and pipeline replacements. And three, an optimized plan 
for pipeline inspections with replacement versus rehabilitation of pipes as needed. As the city inspects more pipes to determine their condition, there may be cost-saving opportunities for the city to do rehab projects rather than replacement projects. So with the completion of the wastewater utility system master plan, the steps forward with the results and recommendations from this project ultimately include, number one, it provides guidance for the engineering community with the identified wastewater system projects they can be used as a starting point for when projects are needed. Number two, it provides a tool to prioritize funding. The CIP recommendations from the project will be used by staff for implementing projects into the CIP for the wastewater system and wastewater projects will be continued to be prioritized with water, streets and drainage priorities. Number three, expand condition assessment program. The city is to continue to further inspect pipelines with televising equipment uh, to determine their actual condition to further prioritize pipes for replacement and gain a better understanding of our, uh, the condition of our entire system. Number four, it provides a method to move towards preventative action with the goal of replacing infrastructure prior to failure. Number five, uh, we'll continue to update GIS and, and our hydraulic model to keep the maps and the hydraulic model current. Number six, the data, data from this project will be utilized for the upcoming utility rate study. And number seven, the recommendations from the project will be used for the infrastructure development plan. Lastly, I wanted to identify that this project was truly a collaborative effort between the consultant team and city staff. I wanted to acknowledge the key players on the project, including the Black and Veatch team of Karen Berge, Robert Schwager, Brian Lent, and Bro Johnston, FMG Engineering, Jason Pettyjohn, and Banner Associates. The Rapid City staff project team was myself and Michelle Lashley as co-project managers. Morgan Falcone, a project engineer, also provided valuable input throughout. Roy Cork is the city's GIS analyst who is heavily involved, as well as Dave Van Cleve, the water reclamation superintendent, was very involved throughout the project. That concludes the presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Bill, go ahead. Thank you, and Mr. Hall was right. That you're really good. That was excellent and logical and concise and clear. Very well done. Thanks. I do have a couple questions for my own learning. Um, force mains, obviously, that's under pressure on the discharge side of, of a pump or something. Where are those used? In an example in town where that's needed, Did you, was it like six or seven of those in our system? Correct. Yep. The city has seven lift stations. Uh, they serve a region of area that can't gravity flow to the water reclamation facility. So the lift station, from the lift station, sewage is pumped through a force main up to the top of a hill somewhere. I got it. All right. And where, where it can then flow by gravity. Yeah, that makes sense then. Um, now, back in your risk analysis, one thing I didn't understand was um, consequence of failure diameter. What would, uh, I don't understand the logic behind that as one of the criteria. Could you explain? Sure, consequence of failure. Um, when it comes to diameter, if you think about it, if you have an eight inch pipe, it's going to have less flow coming through the pipe and have less upstream customers that it would provide service to. As opposed to if you have a 24 inch sewer main that contains or carries larger flow, uh, it's going to have more upstream customers it may affect if there is a, a failure with the pipe. So that's why the diameter was considered one of those criteria. Yeah, I guess it's just a matter of semantics. And, and another thing, the MPO, um, when you went back the planning region. Has there been any regional planning, I mean, with surrounding communities, or is this just rapid city system? Oh, we, I know there's been some discussion, and I don't know what the other communities are doing, uh, but duplication of facilities is probably never a smart idea. 
And so I'm wondering, are they building something in Box Elder? Do we want to combine with them? Is it, uh, I know that's lifting over a major hill and everything, and what, are we doing that sort of planning and working with the region, or is it just us? Certainly, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I believe the term used often in the water and wastewater industry is called regionalization of, of combining, <laughs> combining uh, systems maybe into one. So a component of this project that I didn't specifically talk about, um, but we did reach out to what's considered bulk customers throughout the area and um, areas that would have fallen within those service boundaries. Uh, communities including, you mentioned Box Elder, uh, Somerset, Piedmont, all the communities within our service boundary and any established either sanitary district or um, district that may provide sewer service on their own. We did reach out to them to talk about uh, their needs for the future and whether or not they would um, consider or want to be part of the Rapid City system in the future. So that was considered in our future flows, uh, based on the conversations with those providers, it was considered in our future flows whether or not we would um, consider flows from different, different areas. Um, wasn't necessarily part of the project to go out and actively gain customers. We were just considering long-term what kind of flows do we need to plan for at this point? What was the reaction, the response, uh, interest and non-interest? Because I could see Somerset getting huge, even Blackhawk, but particularly Box Elder is going to be growing a lot. Certainly. So I wasn't involved in the bulk customer meetings. I'm not sure if Michelle Lashley might have more input on that matter than I do. Yeah, I wasn't directly involved in those either, but... Um, when we reached, it was kind of mixed based on what we got from different communities. Some were interested, some were not. I know that uh, during this project, Somerset was uh, a big, um, you know, a big component of what we were looking at. And I think ultimately we decided that they were not going to be part of our system. We were actually working directly on trying to, um, working with them on, on an option to tie into our system. And they, uh, they I think, ultimately decided that they were going to expand their own system and not become part of ours long term. Um, but a lot of what we looked at were the smaller, uh, smaller communities that are currently on septic systems outside of the city. Um, and Box Elder, I don't think, was a, a huge component because it is difficult for them to get to our, our wastewater treatment plant. So. Okay, one more question for Michelle. Have you been practicing your cello? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any questions, Greg? Um, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. And um, I was watching on uh, Sioux Falls News the other day. They were talking about some of their projects. And um, it raised a question for me. Um, you have a 100-year plan that you're talking about. Um, What's the anticipated life, or what's the state of the art for the materials that you're using for the pipes in the ground, things like that, and as far as replacement or the pumps or things like that? I mean, are we looking at, I, don't, I guess, do you know what the state of the art is right now, what your projected um, useful life is for those materials? Um, yes, yeah, so with the project, we did um, consider the useful life of all components, including pipes. Um, pumps at the lift stations, that kind of thing. So um, pipes, our current design life on the pipes that are installed today, the design life is 75 years minimum based on the design criteria that the city has established and the standard specifications that we require our pipes to be built under. Um, for pumps, I'm not sure I recall off the top of my head, pumps and mechanical component, those certainly are, uh, would expect a lot shorter duration I want to say 15 years, 10 to 15 years is the expected design life on a standard pump that would be installed at a lift station. Um, and then every, every different component of the system has a different expected service life. Thank you. If I don't have any more questions. I have a motion to acknowledge from Councilman Lehman, a second from Councilman Evans. All in favor? All opposed, motion passes. 
Item 10, presentation on City Hall Phase 2 renovation project. Late fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rod Johnson with the Public Works Department. Uh, I'm going to give you just a, a very brief overview of, the, of this overall project, and then I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Mark Averett. He's the uh, principal architect with TSP. They have been... Uh, with us all along through this project. Uh, this project actually started in, in 2015 when we were here with the school district and uh, realizing that we were out of space and we were shoving people into storage rooms and closets and, and that sort of thing and trying to make some decisions on uh, what direction we were going. So we did some space study analysis. Uh, in about uh, 2018, the school district uh, chose to leave this building, uh, which gave us an opportunity, at least some, you know, at least a short-term opportunity to take advantage of uh, the space, the space that they had vacated. So, um, with that information and with some early cost estimates, we went through the vision process and were uh, awarded four and a half million dollars for this project. We broke the the project uh, basically into, into three phases. And the first phase involved renovation of the interior spaces um, and um, you know, basically finding a home for, for different departments, how we wanted to allocate the space, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that project was completed through that first phase. Um, we spent uh, just over two million, probably about $2.2 .2 million. Uh, we're now in phase two, and phase two includes, uh, it's kind of a two-component uh, phase. One was the uh, replacing the air handling units, the heat pumps uh, throughout the building. That project was actually awarded a few months ago for just under a million dollars, um, and we are under contract for that, uh, trying to do some planning. They've, they've got these uh, heat pumps uh, on order, it's something that, you know, in today's uh, uh, environment, it takes a long time for delivery of those units, but um, we're uh, starting to put a, uh, a project together in terms of how we're going to go about uh, replacing those units while keeping the building operating. Um, and then there is a second phase of uh, the City Hall renovation, which includes primarily uh, this room and the lobby, and those areas were um, intentionally left out of phase one um, because it really wasn't a situation where we needed to be moving people, um, and we um, um, knew that, you know, that, that there would be some additional renovation, which there is. We've got some minor renovation in the building, and uh, Mark's going to walk you through that. So that's, that's what uh, this phase two project is about. And then um, we, uh, and, and then the final phase is, uh, you know, phase three will be an, uh, some outside work. Um, we, even with the school district gone now, we, um, our parking, we're already at capacity with our parking. So, um, and, and we have some safety concerns out there. So those are some things that we will be addressing uh, in the future, which it's not something that we want to try to overlap on top of this project just because, you know, just construction alone complicates, uh, you know, the parking situation. So with that, um, I am going to uh, turn this over to uh, Mark Averett, um, and he can uh, give you an overview of, uh, of this phase two project. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks, Rod. Uh, we'll walk through here quick, if I can find the right button. Um, there we are. So we thought we'd start <clears throat> uh, with a brief overview uh, of what we're looking at uh, with the West Side Precinct. Just this kind of, I know that's a little deviation, but just so you guys uh, know what we're doing there. Uh, it's an existing bank building. Uh, we're looking at uh, kind of a small renovation inside the core of that building. Uh, adding a number of offices, uh, so places for uh, the uh, you know police officers to sit. Uh, there's a little conference room, uh, and then a door that takes them directly out 
and underneath that existing canopy that's there. Uh, trying to leave as much of it uh, as we can to keep that cost down. Um, but I, you know, this is really all the further we are at this time. I just wanted to uh, give you guys a little brief uh, idea of, of the progress of where that's at right now. As Rod said, uh, in this phase, we're kind of focused uh, on uh, first and second floor with a little bit of work on the third floor. So the majority of the work is in uh, kind of a facelift of the lobby. There's repair of that floor out there that has some settling. Uh, we're working on <clears throat> a couple of additional offices, some storage space, uh, and a continuation of flooring renovation that we did in phase one. And then uh, whichever direction there off the one side uh, we're adding a coiling door for uh, the parking folks uh, to be able to come in and out there's an overhead coiling door uh, they can get uh, their wheeled vehicles in and out of there uh, and out of the weather uh, here uh, in the chambers uh, we're continuing that one as well updating carpet uh, we're going to look at uh, restaining all this wood that you see out here before you uh, and then uh, rework uh, behind the desk where uh, you guys are currently seated. Uh, kind of updating technology, uh, updating those countertops, uh, really a facelift of, of uh, this space. Uh, we'll also be, and I'll show you some renderings here in a minute, but uh, we're also looking at uh, kind of updating the face of this, uh, of the desk, uh, adding some uh, ability to add some magnetic uh, uh, nameplates and uh, some security. We're adding kind of a ramp off to the one side uh, for the council uh, members in case of an emergency. You kind of kind of a back door out, uh, kind of an escape route. Then up at the mayor's, uh, directly above us over here, we're kind of taking out that uh, window and kind of putting all that back that's uh, in front of you guys and then uh, we're splitting the one conference room that's upstairs into two separate conference rooms and then we're going to add kind of a security entrance or a security vestibule uh, per se to kind of slow folks down as they go back into the mayor's office. Uh, so window there, uh, a transaction window under it and so they'll have a little more control over who goes back. Just a quick through some renderings together, uh, just a little more idea of what we're working on here. Just kind of restaining, not doing a lot with this, uh, trying to keep costs down and just give a facelift. Um, some renderings of, of some options. We do have three alternates uh, that we're looking at. Alternate number one is uh, removing the glass uh, uh, behind the council uh, members and uh, going back in with a, uh, a video board um, some possible sound attenuation. We would leave this <clears throat> uh, kind of white uh, with the uh, projection screen. We'd leave that in all options and we'd leave the curtain up uh, for acoustic properties. Uh, but we would be removing that glazing and going back in with a wall. Uh, and then we would do some sort of a metal panel on the back side on the exterior, which we could put any pattern we wanted to onto. Uh, that's the alternate. Base bid is we leave it alone. We don't even touch it. Um, so just as you can see, we're kind of darkening some of the stain, uh, lightening some, just to give it a little refresh. Uh, we're reworking this desk that we're standing at right here. Uh, we're going to rework it uh, to allow some additional accessibility. And this is kind of a rendering of outside then. Uh, uh, that gray spot there in the middle could be any design, any perforated metal panel uh, that we can uh, come up with. Uh, so renderings in the lobby. Uh, we'd update all the flooring. Uh, alternate number two is replacing the flooring up here outside this room. Uh, and alternate number three is replacing the flooring, uh, that tile on the stairs. We will be uh, adding some uh, uh, film onto the glass at the stair railing uh, to try and uh, get the visibility down, uh, enhance some uh, security with that. Uh, we will be replacing or adding some metal panels in here. All of that glazing, uh, except for the doors that were just replaced, uh, will replace all the glazing that's in that front storefront uh, when you come in. So all that glass is going to get replaced. Uh, the sloped glass remains. We're just going to change that glass out to a little darker tint uh, to help with uh, the folks on the main floor to get a lot of glare. 
so that angled piece and then that first batch of glazing, uh, we're going to add a little darker tint to. And then the lower one would be basically the same as what you see it now. It would still have the same appearance from the outside. We would just be uh, with reflectance, but we'll keep uh, the interior, um, you know, give it a little better feeling in there. Uh, changing out the lighting, uh, just in the pendants, phase one, we replaced all the ceilings in there, replaced the can lights, so we're just adding uh, some decorative uh, fixtures. From the top of the stairs looking down, um, uh, yeah, we threw in that color board there as well. Um, cost. If you want me to hit that, make sure. sure. Yep, all right. I might have to zoom in here too. I don't know if I have the right glasses. Um, so the, the lobby renovation we're looking at now, I do have to caveat, as with all estimates, uh, this was a month ago, so we don't know. Uh, but we did our best. A month ago on 620, this is what we thought it was going to cost. Uh, so the lobby renovation was about $250,000. Uh, the council chamber renovation, uh, about 106, 107,000. Uh, and then the renovation throughout the rest of the building uh, is about another 127, 130,000. So the total renovation of uh, phase two, we're looking at about 4837. Uh, the alternates, uh, as one of the questions was how much, uh, to take out the glazing and replace with a wall uh, and uh, provide a rough in for that uh, media wall is about $85,000, $86,000. Um, that media wall and acoustical panels, just for the rough in and acoustic panels only, not including the video wall itself, uh, 9,000. Uh, to replace that second floor uh, tile, uh, about 23, 24,000 uh, to go with the sheet vinyl. And then uh, on the main stairs, it's about 14, 15,000 dollars to replace, uh, pull that tile off and uh, change it with a different material. I think that's, yeah, that's where we were at. Entertain questions. Mr. Evans. A couple questions. Um, okay, obviously the flooring in the lobby with that settling of the slab and the pylons that hold up the building not moving, we have some major issues. You're going to be doing a skim coat down there to flatten things out and then cover it with what kind of product? Well, we're looking at... Uh, but actually, Rod and, and a group went in and surveyed that floor for us early uh, to see exactly what we were looking at. Um, we are going to go, there's some chipped areas of the concrete that we're going to pull up and look and see where the settling and the extent of the settling. Uh, and then we'll have to kind of see how bad or how far that extent is. Uh, but the plan is to kind of put that back. We'd add a topping uh, and to get the floor as flat as we could. And then we're going to go back in with a sheet vinyl product. Um, well, make sure it's a durable product because what we don't want to have is the first time you scoot a piece of furniture across there or something when you have a big tear that's going to be a scar there forever. And I know that's a problem with that kind of a product. Um, it's not really durable in many instances. And there's like old core lawns and stuff that have depth of the surface that can take those kind of things. They can be restored and everything. So. I'm just a little bit concerned about the kind of product that's going down there. I'm really happy to see that the airport is replacing a lot of their temporary surfaces with, um, uh, you know, an aggregate-based uh, terrazzo and stuff, yeah. which is expensive, but it does last for a billion years, and that's the reason they're doing it. So they're making the right choices, and I'm wondering if that might not be a better choice, although I think you're are you concerned with acoustics and absorptive qualities of the product as well, the floor noise, but... It, it would help. Uh, you know, the tile now is acoustically, you know, it's durable, but acoustically it's just not good. Uh, and we have a lot of hard surfaces uh, within the lobby as it is now. Uh, some of the materials we are adding will add to acoustic uh, durability. Uh, but, you know, sheet vinyl is, uh, you know, not as durable as tile, absolutely. Uh, we did not, have not considered terrazzo purely for the cost and the availability of subcontractors to install it. Uh, we'd be happy to look at that. Uh, well, there are know. terrazzo tiles available now that can be installed like regular, you know, tiles. Yeah, it's, 
that are, can last as long as well and look as beautiful. And I think for our front door, a high quality product that um, looks permanent like that is, you know, a choice worth investigating. Um, now, what about the uh, vending machines that are what greet people as they come down the stairs? And that's what every CEO of an Intel corporation wants to look at as he descends a grand staircase in a public building, mm, a pot machine. Uh, are you guys going to relocate those back underneath the stairs to someplace more appropriate? Yes. And perhaps be able to use that for artwork or something a little more inviting? Correct. Correct. Yeah, we would be <clears throat> relocating those under the stairs. Uh, we do have to route some power to those, but uh, there is uh, easy access to that under that stair. So, yes, we are going to relocate those. Uh, we're going to maintain all of the power that's out there now in those floor boxes. Uh, we do have to update those floor boxes as they don't mean accessibility, but uh, and we're going to maintain that access floor that's out there as well. There's a spot of access floor. Uh, we're just going to kind of uh, do a new flooring material over top of that. So, yes, uh, the walls will be more available to uh, additional artwork. Now, on to this feature, which to me is, although it's not used by this current administration, was by previous ones, and it's the best design feature of this whole building. In fact, as I look at those conference rooms that open in glass, the whole, the whole reason they're like that is so when you open this curtain, they're in the park. That's the feature. So this obsession with closing off this wall, to me, is a non-starter. And I don't know why that has become just the reason for driving this whole project when to me it's just a complete silly waste of money and I know that at least one person that is currently announcing and is running for mayor plans on using this wall and opening those curtains and using that park and everything if he's elected because he's told me so so to me I'm not I'm not gonna vote for anything that that to me destroys the best design element of this entire structure. I'd rather take that hundred and some thousand dollars it's gonna to take to just board this window up and invest it in a quality floor that's gonna last for 70 years downstairs, to me. So again, I think this is money poorly spent, it's misadvised, and I think you are being directed by whoever hired you guys, and I'm sure it's this administration said, we wanna get rid of that wall. But I would think that if you just came into this building, that probably, and you were not guided that way, wouldn't be the first thing you'd come after. Now, I know that some people have expressed, oh, it's a security issue. Well, then fine, let's put up a sheet of bulletproof glass up high enough to protect us, and then the problem will be solved. So there's other solutions rather than wasting hundred to $200,000 that's gonna change the exterior of the building as well, make it less attractive, and make this particular studio less desirable as an entertainment space. The last day this was used was the day they announced for the 6th Street project and they hired Lloyd's and I was here for that meeting were you there mm. this was wide open that had all the Lloyd's people and it was a beautiful thing it just because it's an asset and you don't use it doesn't mean we should destroy it or discard it because the next group can this is not a person's particular building this is the community's building and administrations come and go and we do not own it we are stewards of it and it has a feature that you don't like tough you know, don't use it. Just like I can look at screens that drop here and doors that don't close across, but somebody may use that feature. And it was incorporated into the original design for a reason. And I happen to think you're entrusted with maintaining it. You choose it, fine. Use it, if you don't use it, fine, but the next person may. So destroying the element to me is a non-starter. I'm gonna vote against anything that incorporates that. And that's where I'm coming from. And I want the citizens to know and hear I can't think of any bigger waste of money I've seen and we've been asked to vote on sitting in this dais for the last three years than that particular idea. And you can quote me in the journal if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'm looking for... Motion to acknowledge. We have a motion to acknowledge. And a second. 
We have a motion from Councilman Lehman, a second from Councilman Stroman. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. Item 11, authorize staff to advertise for bids City Hall Phase 2 Reconstruction Project, project number 2675, CIP number 51225. If I have no comments on this, I'll look for a motion. I've got a comment from Mr. Evans. Well, we did have a meeting concerning this, and I don't know who was at that. Were you, Mr. Lehman? We were promised we would be given this in parcels so we could vote on particular elements of it. Do you remember that, Mr. Lehman? Yes, we did do that, and we were given those options, and I don't see these options as being necessarily laid out that way, although I did hear the word option one, two, three when it, the presentation was happening. So I'm just wondering where that particular discussion ended up. Um, because I would vote for many of these parts, but again, I would reject certain elements that I think are destructive. So thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, so as uh, Mr. Ehret had indicated, and as you see, as you saw on that uh, cost estimate, uh, this item in particular is alternate number one. We'll have a base bid, we'll have alternate number one, we'll have a couple, couple of more, more alternates. As you mentioned in that meeting, uh, that was brought up and we said, because there was a concern with cost. So, you know, and quite honestly, I'm, I'm concerned with cost too. This, you know, the original estimates, you know, for this project were done <clears throat> a number of years ago. So we will have a base bid in front of you. We will have an alternate, uh, actually three alternates. And you will have the opportunity to, um, the council will have an opportunity to decide which of those alternates to award and which not to award. As uh, Mr. Avert had said, if the alternate isn't awarded, it stays the way it is. So actually, it looks like there's four alternates, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, actually, the the two that you see there are all would all be part of alternate one. Oh, because okay. they the the first two they both have to do with that with that glass and, and oh, so one and two are one bid, one alternate. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I'm just looking for a motion. So I let's just, what we're approving right now is you, you to go out to bid, to bid what you have in front of us, bring it back to us to vote on, correct? That's correct. Once the bids come back. That's correct. So we're just voting right now to put this out for bid. Yes. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from Councilman Lehman, a second from Councilman Stroman. All in favor? Oh, go ahead, Bill. My only and my only concern is that we're not going to see it come back that way, and then we're kind of locked in some from something because, again, I bring up that thing with the pitcher's mound and the stress it's caused some people that trusted the process, and it turned out to not necessarily turn out the way they planned. So I'm a little wary, you know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on everybody. I don't know how that, you know what I'm saying. It's, uh, I'm just concerned. If I vote yes for this, I'm going to end up regretting it. <laughs> so I'm, is it going to be segmented? Is it going to come back separate? The bid to do the window, separate it out from everything else. The bid to do the floor, separate from anything else. And the bid to do security, because to me, that safe room is a major issue. I know it is to a couple other council people. Um, is that gonna be accommodated as well in some of these uh, alternates we have? Because I definitely would vote for that. I definitely would vote for the floor. That's really important to get that taken care of. It never, frankly, should have been taken away. The mayor's office was a safe room that was totally protected. So are those going to be, in, be able to vote or you know, approve segments of the particular project, or are they going to come back as one big project all linked together? So 
That's my question. Okay, so I will reiterate, you get a base bid, and, and then we have alternates. So you can award or not award the base bid. Then you can award or not award any of those alternates. Um, is there anything being done um, over, in, over on this side um, as far as this project is concerned? No, there's some other things that are being done, and you know, and we can certainly, uh, you know, security has always been a, a a major concern. I would argue that that was never a safe room, but I, I think that's an argument for for another time. Um, and if something, if there's additional work that needs to be done, uh, could certainly be done. Um, but uh, security has always been a prime consideration of this project, uh, it was done throughout the building, you know, with, you know, separation of areas, uh, of staff areas, public areas. It was done through an improved video system. It was done through, um, you know, providing public spaces that are in a public area, not necessarily uh, in the, uh, in, on the, let's just say the backside. Of that of that interface, so that most of the public can meet with staff in a uh, in a public area. Um, it was done through um, uh, you know additional um, fob systems, additional hardware systems, um, you know, and and it's really something that we have continued to uh, talk about security. We've actually started a building security committee which is meeting later this week and you know, trying to address some of the operational concerns with security in this building. So um, yeah, we are very concerned about, about security and we you know, continue to be. You know, how, how can you not be? Well, imagine this scenario. A armed person comes in there to that you know, vomitorium right there, that door, and we, on our hands and knees, slip out through that thing to escape, but then he just runs around the corner because there's glass right on the other side to get into that ring, so I guess it becomes, you know, uh, you know fish in a barrel sort of thing. We don't have really a legitimate escape path from here. Not out that one, not out that one, because it will lead to the same thing, rooms that do not have solid doors that we can protect, and that is a major concern to me. So I guess... I don't see it being addressed. Like you're saying, you know, all the security and everything on your, if you're on that side of the partitions and that side of the lockable doors, maybe the council doesn't need to be protected. Maybe that's part of the plan. But uh, that is a major concern to me um, because it just doesn't work. The plan doesn't now. And all you have to do is think about what you, would you do if you were in here and you were a shooter. And I think that needs to be addressed as part of that. Not that, that and the money would be better spent over there, actually accomplishing something that is necessary. Okay, that's where I'm coming from, so. Thank you, Mr. So, Evans. I, if I could, I would just like to add that I'm, 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 not, a, I'm not a security expert, um, but I think we have you know, quite a bit of consensus that uh, a better uh, escape route for Council is in that direction, and we're and we're doing some things to improve that because it's putting it's going into a more a more secure area than this is. Now, granted, um, that might be there might may be a need for that also depending upon you know the situation. But you know, probably having two escape routes um, is is a good idea. The whole you know the whole safe room thing, um, as as I mentioned before. It was never in, in my mind, or I don't think anyone's mind, uh, a safe room. That door was added well after this building was, uh, was, was built. It wasn't designed as an escape into, uh, into a safe room. Now, if there's some things that we need to do
And, and, and listen, I, I don't want to. I don't want to argue that. Like I said, I'm not a security expert, um, so I, I'm not. I'm not going to try to argue whether it is or not. But um, I, I guess you know, like I said, if there's more that we need to uh, to do from a security standpoint, you know, there's there are some things that we have done uh, that um, you know we haven't described in detail. We don't think it's probably appropriate to describe in detail. Um, but I think you know you know. Here's another question. You know, should should we have a security station out front? I think that's you know, there's an opportunity to do that. We haven't necessarily done anything to enhance that because it's really becomes more of an operational situation. Um, but it's it's available to do that. So I think security is is something that we don't want to look at as a project. You know, we think it's something that needs to be viewed as a ongoing program, and um, we want to be open for anyone's um, input as far as security goes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I think that this is a conversation for another time. Um, what we have before us, I think, is pretty simple. We have a bid and we have alternate bids. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilman Lehman, we have a second by Councilman Stroman. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. So we have one person opposed, Councilman Evans. Thank you very much. If I can get a motion to, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, have, we have a motion to be done. All, all in favor? <laughs> Thank you.